I'll do my best. Thank you uh, for a nice uh, presentation. So I'm going to try to convince you that, uh, that we need to do better. We need to do better for our patients. And I think um, the best way forward here is really in the setting of a clinical trial. Um, so I'll, um, I'll start with the key points that, that you heard, that this is really a very different biology. This is a different tumor type. Uh, than what we think of with uh, traditional colorectal cancer. And I'll reiterate some of those very important points that you heard in the prior, uh, the prior presentation from Jolene. This is aggressive biology, uh, poor prognosis. And I'll also uh, show you data that says, you know, when we just use the tools that we have available as standard of care, we really don't get the benefit that we'd like. And I'll uh, try to convince you that, that it's really, a, uh, we need to really look hard at some of the existing data with uh, full Fox theory and BEV. And then finally, to share with you some really exciting data that things are looking uh, better for this. We're seeing activity uh, for these agents. So uh, when we think about the BRAF, we, you know, we know even at the very earliest stage of carcinogenesis that this is a different pathway. The BRAF mutant tumors are much more likely to arise from these sessile serrated adenoma pathways, so even the gastroenterologist will tell us that things look different from the beginning. When we talk about the mutation, this is different than what you heard about with KRAS, that the vast majority of the mutations are at one single codone, the V600, uh, and in colorectal cancer, most commonly V600E. So when we're talking about BRAF mutations, we're really ex uh, interested in the V600 uh, codone. Now, when you get these panels, occasionally you'll get uh, other mutations and other sites uh, that are much less common. Those are, the, some of those are inactivating, unknown, uh, but this is really uh, the subset that uh, is relevant for colorectal cancer. Now, how is this different? Well, we know it's different clinically. I mean, we know that these are sick patients that don't respond well to standard therapy. But we also know they have very different patterns of uh, metastasis. They're more likely to have cancer in the peritoneum, uh, distant lymph nodes uh, in the retroperitoneum. This is a population that can have brain metastases, obviously something we don't see very commonly. And occasionally you'll get these odd dermal metastases as well. So these are the patients that we've always known that something's different about the biology. And now that we have some of this molecular testing, we understood that a lot of these patients have this BRAF mutation. Now, you saw the data about very uh, poor overall survival, 10 months versus 35 months in this series, a hazard ratio of 10. So that's why we say test for BRAF mutation. Now, when we think about this on a more molecular basis, uh, and, and here I show a, a very exciting new classification system that I think you'll hear more about from Dr. Tabanero in, in a little bit, so I won't belabor. But this idea that when we look at how colorectal cancer uh, is subgrouped, that these really fall into a very unique uh, population. Now, what about standard of care therapy? Uh, so here's a cohort of 127 patients, which is more than have been reported in, in all the randomized studies uh, put together. But what we see is that you can get a very short, with standard treatments, get a short progression-free survival. This is uh, standard of care approaches, six months. But after that, these are patients progressing at first restaging, two months, two months, two months, right? So this is a population that it's rare that we kind of get on top of. Now, you heard some of the data from the TRIBE study, which is the randomized phase three data that, that really forms the foundation for the argument that chemotherapy is, uh, um, is, the, uh, is the option for first treatment. And you heard that number of a 19.1 month uh, median overall survival for patients getting this kitchen sink approach for BRAF mutations, albeit in less than two dozen patients. Now, we could, be, uh, we could be very picky and say, well, what about the statistics? What's the p-value? That's certainly not significant. You saw the wide range on the, uh, on the hazard uh, ratios. Uh, but we also need to see where that 19.1 month come from. And as you see in the stair-stepping of that survival plot, the dark green curve being the full Fox Erie and Bev, um, and we'll have to pull out the magnifying glass here for a minute to really understand what's going on, where that 19 months come from. 
Uh, and it turns out that uh, just was uh, a shy of difference of 12 months, right, which is just what we expect with our, with our registry data, right? So should we get too excited about a median survival of 19.1 months uh, when, uh, you know, a stopwatch uh, could have made a difference between a 12-month median survival? So, so we do have to be careful about these small series. Now, I'm very, uh, uh, very supportive of these efforts to try to understand more about the BRAF population, but, uh, but we have to uh, be cautious before uh, making uh, conclusions. So how do we treat them? Well, the, uh, you know, several years back, the idea was we have a, a mutation. Uh, we've got the nail and a hammer, so let's just try to, to put it together. Uh, and after wandering in the woods for uh, several years uh, with treating with BRAF inhibition or BRAF and MEK, it was clear that we really were not getting the responses that we need as single or doublets, despite the activity that was seen in uh, melanoma. But there was a key finding that uh, came out of some, uh, uh, some very nice work out of Rene Bernard's group in these unbiased screens looking at what else is going on besides the BRAF mutation. And a key finding here is that there's this feedback mechanism. So we think about kind of the whack-a-mole of colorectal uh, biology, that you hit this pathway and something else pops up. And the important finding was, what is that something that pops up? And the finding here is that when you inhibit BRAF, you get reactivation of EGFR. Now, that's something, uh, EGFR is something we know how to target. And this is interesting because we'd say, in the absence of BRAF mutation, inhibiting EGFR has very modest benefits, if much at all, in colorectal cancer. But what we're saying here is that it becomes even more relevant when we hit the BRAF node, then we reactivate EGFR. So I'll show uh, um, uh, this idea here with uh, one, uh, one animal slide uh, in mice models, just really pretty data that's been seen elsewhere as well, but this idea that BRAF alone doesn't work, EGFR inhibitor alone doesn't work, as you see from the curves, but when you put them together and block both the initial pathway and that reactivation, now we're starting to see the activity. And this has really been the fundamental uh, a finding that's led to a whole host of clinical trials. And sometimes I joke that there's as many clinical trials ongoing right now as there are BRAF mutant patients. Uh, so every uh, patient can have their own personalized study. Uh, it's not quite that bad, but that's exciting because there's, there's a lot of uh, activity and a lot of uh, interest. I say that because there's opportunities out there that you can find trials for your patients. But this fundamental uh, backbone has been BRAF inhibition and EGFR inhibition. And, and there's a variety of different pathways being explored. Uh, the first is kind of adding in chemotherapy. So should we forget about good old-fashioned chemotherapy? And, and here again, my second and final mouse uh, study. But what we showed is that when you do this combination, uh, you get stasis, right? But what we want in our patients is really regression. And when you add that arena TKN in, add that apoptotic push that we're familiar with, now you start to get robust responses uh, in, uh, in patients or in the uh, mice. Now, we've uh, reported last year the activity of that combination in uh, phase one uh, population uh, and indeed seeing some very nice responses. I'm pleased to say the study is completed and this response rate uh, is holding up about 18 patients. Uh, enrolled, still small, but remember the historic response rate for cetuximab and arena TCAN is less than 10% in this population, right? So we would not expect much just with the standard of care agents. And I'll show you one kind of provocative cross-trial comparison, which is when you take the patients on this study and look at how long they're on study and how they're behaving and compare that with, uh, with kind of match patients with BRAF mutation, getting that alone. We're really starting to see signals uh, that this is, uh, this is really what we sh uh, the approach that we should be taking for our patients. Now, this is still early cross-trial comparisons, and really the, uh, the uh, randomized studies I'll show in a minute will get these answers. Now, the other approach is to say, if it's all about MAP kinase pathway reactivation, then maybe we need to do BRAF, MEC, and EGFR. So three signaling agents to really uh, hit that, and that's the approach that GSK has taken. 
uh, reports that Joanna Bendel uh, shared, but uh, um, is an uh, effort of uh, many, including uh, Dr. Tabanero in the room. BRAF, EGFR showed some activity, not a whole lot, but when you put the triplet together, now you start to see a more robust uh, response rate, 40% in what uh, has been reported. Now, the key here is uh, that what really matters is our ability to inhibit the MAP kinase pathway. And in melanoma, you can give a single agent BRAF inhibitor, and you can get a robust pathway inhibition. So this is actually uh, very hard gathered data across uh, several studies looking at paired biopsies asking how well we inhibit. And if you look in the far right, you see that melanoma, single agent, you get nice inhibition. But you can see that when you do uh, just some of these together, including BRAF and MEK, you don't quite get there. But it, in, in this setting, it really takes uh, a, a variety of combinations in order to get a robust pathway inhibition. So that's why we need combinations to, to start to get close to activity we see in melanoma. So a variety of studies. There's really uh, kind of two big approaches that are being moved forward. Um, and uh, that uh, are around those with the highest activity level. Uh, the FOCUS-4 study uh, plans uh, are ongoing. I uh, not, don't think it's yet been activated of the BRAF, uh, MEC, uh, EGFR combination here. Uh, this same combination is going to be explored in a randomized uh, uh, study by uh, GSK, which will now be by Novartis. Um, uh, that Dr. Tabanero is uh, leading as well. So they'll have opportunities here to really look at some of the, uh, this, um, this triplet combination. Um, here in the U.S., I think we're very excited. We have this study up and going. Uh, it's a cetuximab arena TCAN in patients who have had at least uh, some prior treatment for metastatic disease but can have no more than two prior progressions, kind of a second, third-line study. So as long as the patients have not received arena T I'm sorry, cetuximab before, they're eligible. Randomized to cetux, arena TCAN, with or without vemurafenib. The endpoint here is progression-free survival. For patients on the control arm, they're able to then cross over to get the, uh, the triplet um, at the time of, uh, of progression. It's uh, open through all the cooperative groups. If for some reason your site is not screening for BRAF mutations, there is central screening available. Again, as Axel said, I really hope that everyone is doing BRAF uh, testing as part of uh, standard of care. So the, um, the final message I want to leave you with is that indeed, once we're understanding the biology better, patients with colorectal cancer and BRAF mutations can have durable responses and meaningful responses. And this is a patient getting combination therapy, uh, uh, still on therapy, uh, no evidence of disease activity. Uh, this is uh, an abdominal wall uh, uh, mass that had eroded through that is completely regressed. And patients alive, still on therapy, three and a half years uh, now ongoing. So it's this idea when we understand what, what the biology is, we really can uh, make a difference. So I'll end with the key points. This is aggressive biology, poor prognosis, we need to do something different, that uh, full Fox theory in BEV uh, is uh, not completely clear that that's any better than the standard of care chemo doublets that we have, uh, and that's really been underwhelming in this population. So really, the data suggests we should enroll patients on protocols. There's protocols out there, including the cooperative group study, for your consideration. Thank you for your time.